Today I'm heading up to a place called Galloway in Scotland to visit a guy called John Ashcroft, a self-employed panel beater, car restorer, car enthusiast and full-blown petrol head who decided nine years ago to pick up sticks and move from his native Liverpool along with his entire car collection to this remote beauty spot for a more quieter life. What's that, John? Yeah, just over on the right here, Gary, we've got the old Cretown quarry, which goes right back to the 18th century. The majority of the rock quarried was shipped down to Liverpool by barge from the quayside, just on the left-hand side here, down the Irish Sea, direct to Liverpool. Wow. Approximately 100 years ago. Whilst whisking me off to a secret location to show me some of his lifetime spoils, he recounts fond memories as a child in the 1960s of his eccentric local news agent back in Oral Park in Liverpool, delivering newspapers out of the window of an E-Type Jaguar, fueling an obsession that drove him to restore his first E-Type at just 18 years old, an obsession that stayed with him for over 40 years. Yeah, this is the uh, this is the Ashcroft car cave, Gary. <laughs> what a car! Sixty one, maybe within the prototype realms. So this wasn't a production car, it's before it went into production? It is actually a production car and it features the outside lock system which was put on the production cars yeah. because there was no inside bonnet locking system that had been devised because at the time the cars should not really have been released after the Geneva Motor Show in March 61. What do you mean it shouldn't have been released? It should not really have been released because the development work on the car in some ways was not really correct with engineering. The cars did suffer from overheating problems. So people were basically guinea pigs, the first customers? Yeah, essentially the first uh, 90 right-hand drive cars and about the first 350 left-hand drive cars were sort of prototype yeah. mock-up cars which were released as on general sale. But because they're a car that looks like it's landed from space in 1961, these, uh, these were touted as a 150 mile an hour car, weren't they? But I think it was a highly tuned one and they took on a racetrack with a race driver and, you know, to achieve that 150, but they weren't really, were they? They were tested uh, up and down the M1. However, those particular vehicles did feature some performance enhancements, but most of the original cars out of the factory would have been more around the 130, 140 yeah. mark. I think uh, Enzo Ferrari was quoted as saying it was the most beautiful car ever designed at the time. This is perfect, John. Yep. I mean, look, it's like a brand new car, isn't it? Yeah, this particular... What's going on there, John? Come on. Yeah, this, <laughs> this particular car has gone through some restoration, albeit maybe about 10 years ago now. Yeah, it's stood up well, hasn't so it? So essentially it's held up well. It's been kept here in our indoor storage facility, which is heated and obviously dry and humidity controlled, which gives... But you take these out, don't you? Yes, these, these cars, I'll take them out maybe three or four times a year. Even on salted roads? Even on salted roads, and they'll be brought back immediately and cleaned back. But generally, we'll try as much as possible to avoid any salt situation if we can. Yeah. These cars all need to be run. And are these triple SUs, are they? Yeah, these carburetors are triple SU. I, th I think from what I can remember, I sometimes getting confused, these are HS8s. So these are two inch inlet chokes on them, and there's three of them. This is the world famous XK E engine. There was actually a four cylinder version of this, which is very, yeah. very rare. But most of them are 3.4, and they were taken to 3.8. And I see it's got the infamous Lucas electrics as well. Lucas, yeah, unfortunately, it was originally supposedly Lucas King of the Road, and it became the Prince of Darkness. <laughs> but yeah, the electrics were always pretty much unreliable. And tell me, John, you know the wheels on these, they were always spoked, weren't they? 
they, they never had like a kind of generic wheel to begin with in the prototypes or anything? No, they were generally always spoked. Um, to so, keep the brakes cool maybe? Yeah, to keep braking cool, to keep ventilation into the brakes. Tell me John, what's the difference in, is this a lightweight one? So, okay Gary, this car here is another 1961 outside lock car which is in left hand drive form and over the years it's retained essentially 80% of its original DNA and it's received some upgrade modifications to the engine and also to the chassis which includes upgraded brakes, upgraded shock absorbers. Manifold. Yeah, I think you'll see on your side we've got an upgraded manifold here to get some more power. It still runs the two inch SUs but it runs an extra set of spoke systems on the wheels to give extra rigidity on the wheels. Um, it does run a modern five-speed gearbox. And doesn't it look nice with the hard top on? And the hard top is an added feature which gives it more usability. Some people you know, will use, the, use these cars all year round. I think I read somewhere uh, when these were being designed, there was an apprentice and he'd only been there a few weeks at the factory. And the boss came up to him and said, can you draw? And he was like, yeah, I'll have a go. He said, design an exhaust system for this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he spent an afternoon drawing it, and apparently that's the same exhaust that went right through all the E type jacks. He just, it, it was just right, it just worked, you know. Yeah, essentially, maybe a bit of wood buying packet design. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not the best design in the world, but it worked, and it just remained with the car right through production. And obviously, visual as well, yeah. it gives that twin exhaust system that sports look, and, and, that also, sound and well. also the sound as yeah. well, which is a really barky sound on the the straight six on yeah. the XK engine. And tell me, John, you see the way the, the fuel flaps here? Yes. Is it the same on all of them? Or does some of them have a fuel flap on the, the back bit? I mean, how do they vary? Right through all of these types, they fe feature that. The race cars will feature a central filler cap here. I suppose that's like the, the D-types and the XKSS. The D-types. They, they and, they? and then obviously the actual lightweight E-type, which was full lightweight aluminium body, yeah. which came out in 63. When did you cease production on this? The whole the whole E-Type series was finished around about 72, 73 in favour of the XJ S-Type to satisfy the American market. Well, let, let's face it, John, I mean, the XJS, as lovely as it was, was no replacement for the E-Type Jaguar. I mean, completely different lines, performance, sound. I mean, it was just a completely different car altogether, wasn't it? It, it couldn't, you know, it couldn't be seen as a replacement for it anyway. I mean, these were just no, that, that's true. off the charts, weren't they? That is true, Gary. The XJS, was that originally, I read somewhere that it was originally designed with a rear engine, with, with a glass cover. Yeah, I have seen some of that, <coughs> some of that which goes back to the XJ13 uh, development car, yeah. um, which there's only a couple of them left. So obviously those were developed in mind because the XJS run the V12 engine. Yeah. And the XJ13 that also run the V12. And engine. wasn't it meant to be a two seater, but it was something to do with taxes? They could sell the car cheaper or, or pay less tax on it when they were building it if it was a four seater instead of a two seater. Something yeah. on those lines. Yeah, anyway, quite possibly at the time. Uh, a tax expert will probably tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> but I thought you were a tax expert. <laughs> oh, I'm a tax expert, I'm not a tax expert. <laughs> so you've got a third one over there? Oh, yeah, we do have today third car. So is this a series one also? Right again, Gary, this car is another 1961 outside lock, left hand drive, prototype car, finished in carbon red with black leather. The archetypal colour for an E-type, some people call it sail room red. The resale nice red. Resale red, sail room red. The colour of the 60s. British racing green, wasn't it? And British green. Uh, yeah. A lot uh, of white ones as well. Quite a lot of white ones. I mean, you don't see many of them because, like you say, they would be painted to a more desirable yeah. colour. Yeah, it's unfortunately, a, a couple of weeks ago, if you would have been here, uh, I did have my right-hand drive. I was gonna say these are all left-hand drives, aren't they? These are left-hand drives. I've just sold my right-hand drive. And that particular car, it was quite a famous car. 
that uh, came in from Jamaica. It was originally a UK car, right hand drive, went round the world, needed some work, and uh, we restored the car over a two, nearly three year period. Unfortunately, it's gone now. Still got two lovely ones. How many do you need? Well, at one stage, Gary, we did have uh, double figures uh, within this facility. All series ones? All series one outside lock cars, uh, which was basically our collection. And over the past three to four years, we've narrowed them down and rationalised them as much as we can. Uh, we'll we'll see, still keep moving with these types, but at the moment, we've expanded into a few other bits and pieces and there's only so many hours in the day that you can work and look at yeah. e-types. We've got a great facility here though. Yeah, well thanks Gary. Wow, look at this. Tell me about this John. That's a piece of art that isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It's wow. real, real art form for marketing purposes this particular pump again is pre-war it's all been restored obviously it's been re really high standard it's been restored it's a twin dispensing pump it was originally an australian pump made by gilbert and barker who still manufacture petrol pumps today yeah so that's what that's all about i can't believe how many you've got yeah we've got a good selection of pumps in here uh, at the moment i think we're running on about 20 pumps Wolsey 690, is it? Yeah, and this car, uh, 1956 Wolsey 690. Weren't they police cars? Many of them are used as police cars. Metropolitan Police, probably had about five, six hundred of them. Or trafficators. Trafficator system, yeah. That dash is incredible, isn't it? And the dashboard on these particular ones, the very early cars, uh, was slated when they first came out because it's got a lot of American influences. Quite retro, isn't it? It's retro, yeah. Which and a little bit Art Deco. A well. little bit of Art Deco. And what gauge steel was used on this? It'll probably be round about 18, 20 gauge steel. Out of a 10,000 production run, known Is in the world. They only made 10,000? They made 10,000 of them. And these were police cars? They were police cars, and the police probably had about 1,000 of those throughout the UK. But I take it it wasn't nationwide, it was probably, what, London or something? Generally, London police yeah. had most of the issues. That's where all the crooks are, isn't it? Oh, well. <laughs> It could well be. Just joking. And worldwide that we know about really, there's probably 200 known cars throughout the world. So this used to light up? Yeah, that was the trademark of Woolsey cars, synonymous uh, with crooks, who, if you've seen many of the old Scotland Yard films, you would see these in the rear view mirror and associate the light up badge with police activity. And what was that bell? They used, to, they used to always have a bell in them films, didn't they? And the bell, which you do have a bell for this car, is what's known as a Winkworth bell. It should sit here on a police car in place of this fog light, which funny enough was used until about 72, 73, and even some of the Sweeney series, very early on with John Thor and Dennis Waterman, would actually feature a Winkworth bell on the front of the car. This reminds me of the Rolls Royce. The Rolls Royce, yeah. Another way it comes onto the, the bumper. Yeah, well, what they call a front apron, that would be called. Some people would call it a front scuttle, but I come from the bodywear trade and we would call that a front apron. It sounds like you've got a bit of a soft spot for these cars. I do have a soft spot for the 690 from my father, who was a policeman. You've got a real eclectic mix in here. You've got some modern ones. You've got some fantastic petrol pumps as well. I mean, I don't really know much about petrol pumps, but these look like 20s or 30s, these ones. Yeah. Are they, which are the most valuable or which would you say were your favourites? Yeah, all of the pumps in here are all pre-war pumps. So, feature hand pumping systems, which are hidden in the cabinet here. Oh, I see. So the way that this system would work is the same system. It would use a hand pump mechanism to pump the fuel up from the tank and then it would fill up these two half gallon dispensers, which would show here and the customer would see that there's two half gallon dispensers full. Yeah. So if he was looking for a gallon of fuel, when the fuel is dispensed, these would empty out. And, and he, if he wanted 10 gallons, he'd have to do that 10 times, yeah? Absolutely, yeah. God, so there has to be a queue outside the petrol station. <laughs> a very time consuming system, but that particular pump is 1922. And the significant feature with that is that's the age that my dad 
was born 1922 my dad would be a hundred so this particular feature would be in garages when my dad was born police car another Wolsey as well and we've got another Wolsey 690 again yeah. yeah so coming back to this police car yeah this is a backup car for the heartbeat tv series back in the day <laughs> and yeah as you can see we've got the clapperboard there so this I, I remember these as a kid yeah they were useless police cars weren't they yeah essentially they were just a presence of a of a police car when the the police system was changed i think in 1965 when bobby's on the beat um were changed to traffic policing this particular car would be valid with that this particular one is a very very early old dynamo as well early dynamo this is a 1960 car which yeah, is one of the it. very very first of the 105 123 e I, I remember seeing it like a pale green one of these and it was the very last one off the production line in the museum in liverpool yeah the liverpool car as far as i know to my knowledge i think think is the first car from Halewood production yeah um no doubt somebody will pick up on that anyone yeah. who knows about the Ford either the first one off the production line or the last one this particular car is a 1960 car it's a nice solid car and it's just going through a little bit of recommissioning at the moment yeah how many gears were these were these just three or was it these four? are a four speed as far as i know i've driven this car about a bit and it's a four speed i think there's just about a thousand or eleven seventy two yeah engine on them 60 mile an hour downhill with your foot to the floor yeah just very <laughs> mediocre performance but essentially the first of the panda cars as we know them which is the multicolor high exposure police cars to give exposure of police activity within your area so how many years have you been collecting all this job yeah off and on gary collecting um some people call it junk Probably 50 years, uh, linked in with my dad, who was a big auction man. One man's junk is another yeah. man's treasure. Well, trash and treasure as people This is a real treasure trove. And tell me, is this, are you going to continue collecting or are you deciding to pare down your collection and sell a few things? Is this for sale? Yeah, I mean, like the E-types? And... Answer to your question, yeah. Uh, some of our outside lock Series 161 Jaguars actually are for sale. I'm sure you won't have any problems, John. These are absolutely immaculate. Yeah, well, thanks, Gary. These generally uh, are quite a hard car to restore, and the expense of restoring these cars can range from £70,000 for a self-build yeah. up to a professional build of maybe £200,000. It's cheaper to buy one done. Essentially, it's Especially always... as done as well as this. It's always cheaper, and it's always much more practical to buy a car with known history yeah. and known restoration Tell me about this sign, John. I love your signs. Yeah, this particular Jaguar sign would be a dealer sign. Yeah. And this dates from the mid-50s. Uh, it may possibly be early 60s. I've never seen one of them. No, they, these signs themselves are very, very rare. This particular sign actually came from a really big dealership um, in London. I think it was Henley's, but I could mm. be wrong. I like the India sign. Oh, of course, your daughter is named Indy, so I can see the connection with that one. It's all in the detail, isn't it, John? This is like... It's the detail. Such a nice job. It's the detail, yeah, it really is. This particular car, the feature on it, the suede green and the green interior, uh, is, is quite something in itself. I love the hard top. You know when you see cars for sale, if they're a convertible, they always have the top down. If I was selling a car, I'd have the top up or the hard top on because I just think the lines are so much nicer. Green. Weren't the first ones that were brought out convertibles yeah the convertibles were brought out alongside the coupe so the coupe oh, and the convertible were brought out the same in 61 i didn't realize that i thought they were convertibles first yeah. and then the coupe came later yeah no they were all brought out at the same time all the big hitters had one of these didn't they george best adam fate I and mean, you go right through all the celebrities and singers and actors at the time yeah this was the yeah. car to have yeah that's that's right gary um they were the car of choice and the color of celebrity fame yeah. Um, I mean, you'd as, arrived if you had one of these. Well, obviously, 1961, the world's changed from black and white, really, to colour. Yeah. We've got the whole social system that's changed and all of the um, revolution within. It's it's amazing, isn't it? You can, it's like a milestone of car, isn't it? You can, a particular design or model of car, it marks a specific, you know, part of, yeah, of history and 
what was happening at the time. It's... Yeah, it will stamp. It will stamp. Yeah, the history. I mean, I've got in my hand a glasses guidebook from 1969. The industry trade for valuation. Oh, so that's got all of the, the the prices at the time. The E-type values for 1969 for a, a car would be only three or four hundred pounds. Which back in the day, it's a lot of money though, wasn't it? Back it in was the day. still a fair amount of money. We that looks like this. an old sign, that. Yeah, the India sign. That would be. What's that? Twenties, thirties. Yeah, thirties sign. That is an original sign, as are all of our signs here. Got a lot of enamel signs as well. Enamels, what's, yes. What's, what's this? Yes, what's the story do. behind that nose cone? Yeah, and the nose cone here. There's some damage there, isn't there? Yeah, this is obviously a race car, and it belonged to Mike Wilkinson, who runs a Jaguar setup, MC yeah. Wilkinson, and they do sales, repairs, restorations, and as you can see, race car. So it was crashed. Is so that aluminium? This particular one is fiberglass, and it's a copy of a lightweight nose cone, which features a bigger louver system with 21 louvers to get more air movement through to keep the, the three eights running cool as they possibly can it's a, a legacy of a crash remnant uh, yeah. which we've ended up with here what a man cave yeah well thanks gary as i say it's taken us quite some time um i've had various man caves over the years but this particular one um it's a lifetime of is, collecting, a, isn't it? is a passion um of all sorts of eclectic Items from, you know, toys, vehicles, antiquities, engineering-based yeah. products. Is, it, is that the kettle like an air boiler? The kettle? Oh, okay. <laughs> is it that time? Yeah, cool. Shall yeah. we? Cool. Thank you for watching this episode of Gary Mather's Classic Obsession. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe and join me next time as I continue my journey through Scotland and visit a guy called Fraser and take a test drive on the legendary Talbot.